Welcome to this episode of Political Science Class 11. In the last episode, we have seen India's first pass the poll system. We have compared it with the proportional representation system where we had seen the levels at which uh, elections are held in India, both direct and indirect. And as promised to you in the earlier episode, we'll look at first the reserved constituencies and second the phenomenon of free and fair elections. What exactly are reserved constituencies? You may have heard of this particular term. Constituencies are reserved both at the union and the state levels. You know that India has a history of oppression that can be linked to caste-based discrimination. Caste-based discrimination leading to oppression. The fear of the constitution makers, the founding fathers was that those belonging to the oppressed classes, or rather the formerly oppressed classes, they may be left out of political participation in the new political system under India's new constitution. So they wanted to put an end to the politics of exclusion. India's politics had to be the politics of inclusion. Each and every section of society must be represented. So what are reserved constituencies? Certain constituencies are set aside both in the Lok Sabha and the Vidhan Sabha as reserved constituencies for scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. In these constituencies, everyone votes. Voting is not based on caste. Voting is open to all voters. But the candidates belong either to the scheduled castes or to the scheduled tribes. If a constituency is reserved for scheduled castes, then all the candidates, regardless of party or regardless of being a party candidate or an independent candidate, all the candidates, regardless of his or her party status, shall be scheduled caste candidates. And if a constituency is reserved for scheduled tribes, then all the candidates, regardless of his or her party status, will belong to the scheduled tribes. So, what we must know that everyone in the constituency shall vote, but then the candidates will either belong to scheduled castes or scheduled tribes. Now, seats are reserved for SCs and STs in proportion to their population in India. Presently, 79 seats are reserved for SCs and 41 for STs in the Lok Sabha out of the 543 Lok Sabha seats. But then in the state, in every state, the number of scheduled tribes and number of scheduled castes, the percentage in the population may not be the same. For example, in Punjab, there is no scope for scheduled tribes. So there are no constituency is reserved for scheduled tribes. That is a peculiar phenomenon in the state of Punjab, in entire India. So seats are reserved for scheduled tribes and scheduled castes in every state according to their population. Now a constituency with a high proportion of scheduled caste voters is reserved for scheduled castes and that with a high percentage, a high proportion of scheduled tribe voters is reserved for scheduled tribes. But then an attempt is made, all efforts are made to ensure that there is no concentration 
of reserved constituencies in a particular region in a state. So, the reserved constituencies are spread across the state. There is no concentration. And who decides that which constituency should be reserved or declared as a reserved constituency, whether SC reserved for SC or reserved for ST? An independent commission known as the Delimitation Commission, it works in tandem with the Election Commission. Actually, this constituency draws the boundaries, this commission rather, it draws the boundaries of every constituency. You will see that there are certain constituencies which had existed at one point of time that does not exist now. For example, in Delhi, we had one constituency known as the Outer Delhi constituency, in which areas so far as Rohini and JNU would come. And that was regarded as the largest constituency, parliamentary constituency in the world. That constituency does not exist any further. So this commission that I was talking about, the Delimitation Commission, which works in tandem with the Election Commission, this actually decides the boundary of every constituency. And this also decides which constituency shall be reserved for SCs and which constituency shall be reserved for STs. So that is for the Delimitation Commission to decide and then forward to the Election Commission. So, why do we have reserved constituencies? For the simple reason that no section of society goes underrepresented or unrepresented. Certain sections of the population may be underrepresented, certain sections of the population may not be represented at all. So, to prevent this calamitous situation, the Election Commission reserves certain constituencies for SCs and STs. Another reason is that the British had also, when they ruled India before 1947, and whatever democracy they wanted to uh, introduce in India through gradual doses, as they would like to say, they had introduced a system and like all other systems that they had introduced, a system they had introduced known as separate electorates. What were separate electorates? In which the candidate to be elected belonged to one particular community and in that constituency, voters would all belong to that, that particular community. So, the community of the voters and the community of the candidate would coincide. This would, of course, and it of course it did, give rise to a feeling of separatism among the Indian electorate. So, separate electorates which gave rise to a feeling of separatism and, in, and you know that India had suffered a very devastating partition on communal lines. And one of the reasons why Pakistan was formed, why the Muslim League, the All India Muslim League had won in the elections of 1937, one of the reasons were, was the separate electorates. So under the new constitution, separate electorate system was done away with. And in the place of the separate electorates, a new system was brought in known as reserved constituencies, where the candidates, of course, are either SCs or STs according to the nature of the constituency. If it is reserved for SCs, then the, uh, then the candidates are all SCs. If it is reserved for STs, then the candidates are all STs. But voters are all voters of that particular constituency not in a, an SC reserved constituency, the voters are only SCs, or in an ST reserved constituency, the voters are all STs. This does not happen. So, no feeling of separatism 
could arise as a result of the reserved constituencies. So here we will see, as promised to you, the nature of free and fair elections. As you have heard time and again from leaders, as you have read in the newspapers, and as you have heard from even the Election Commission, this particular term, free and fair election, what does it mean? As you know that whosoever is a voter in India is a citizen. No non-citizen can vote in India. So every citizen must have the freedom to exercise his or her right to vote without fear, without favor, without any obstacle, or without any influence. The voter may not vote out of fear, may not have taken a favor for someone to vote for a particular candidate or a party. Obstacles may not be put for preventing him or her from reaching the polling station. And he or she may not be influenced in a wrong manner in casting his or her vote. So the election process must be transparent. Nothing must be hidden. There should be no unfair electoral practices. At one point of time and today it has been eliminated in a very big way, known as booth capturing and rigging, box jamming. All these things used to happen at one point of time. Now because of the EVMs and the voter I cards, these things have been, even though not altogether eliminated, they have been controlled to a large extent. So these things should not happen. If these things happen, then elections cannot be regarded as free and fair. And most of all, the election results must reflect the will of the people. The will of the people, as I told you in the first episode, the consent of the people, the government is formed on the basis of the consent of the people. So the election results must reflect the will of the people. The government produced, that is produced as a result of the elections, must be based on what the people want. So that is why we have free and fair elections. So now I'll introduce you to another term, is universal adult suffrage. What does it mean? that every citizen, every adult citizen, 18 years or above, regardless of caste, sex, religion, race, ethnicity, language, property, income, or educational qualification, every citizen must be eligible to vote in general elections. General elections means elections to the Lok Sabha state elections and local elections. No one can be prevented on these grounds. Now one thing you must remember that there are many countries leading modern capitalist industrial countries like the United States and Great Britain which had not given women the right to vote at the beginning. Britain does not have a written constitution but America does. But even then the United States did not give its women the right to vote in the constitution that they framed in 1789. But that is not the case with India. India had given the universal adult suffrage from the beginning, from the time the constitution was adopted in 1950 and the first elections were held in 1952. So that was a revolutionary constitution indeed and we are proud of that. But then it was not the case with age. Initially when the constitution was adopted, the voting age was minimum 21 years. But then the constitution 61st amendment act of 1988, that amended article 326, the relevant portion, 
and reduced the voting age, lowered the voting age to 18 years. And the first election, the Lok Sabha election of 1989 was the first election in which the voting age had been reduced to 18 years. Also, there is another qualification. Section 62, subsection 5 of the Representation of the People's Act 1951. It lays down that no person confined in prison or in lawful custody of the police can vote in elections. So if you are, if a person is a voter is in jail or in custody of the police for some reason, he or she may not vote in the election. So there are certain qualifications. But then, there is the right to contest, just as there is the right to vote, there is also the right to contest. Each and every individual in India, each and every citizen has the right to contest. In other words, the election system is open to all Indian citizens, but then there is an age bar to be a candidate. There are certain restrictions, certain bars which you cannot violate. For example, for the Lok Sabha elections and the Vidhan Sabha elections, you have to be a minimum of 25 years of age. You also have to see the relevant articles that are given. You must note down the relevant articles as I speak. So as far as the Lok Sabha elections and Vidhan Sabha elections are concerned, a candidate must not be less than 25 years. As far as the Raj Sabha elections are concerned, a candidate should not be less than 30 years. Similarly, for Vidhan Parishad, it is 30 years. But for the president and the vice president, the minimum age required is 35 years. Now you may say that the vice president is ex officio chairman of the Raj Sabha and he is elected by them. Now if the minimum age required for getting elected to the Raj Sabha is 30 years, then why is the minimum age for getting elected as vice president is 35 years? Is there an, isn't there an apparent anomaly? I would say no, because on the death removal or resignation of the president, the vice president becomes acting president. So there cannot be an age gap like 35 years and less than 35 years. Both have to be above 35 years. You cannot have a vice president who is less than 35 years. And if he is less than 35 years, he cannot be the president. He cannot be the acting president. He cannot act as president in case of the death, removal or resignation of the president. So both the president and the vice president have to be a minimum of 35 years of age when they are elected. Now there is also a legal bar that any person who has been in imprisonment, who has been sentenced to an imprisonment of two years or more for any offense, cannot contest elections. And no person out on bail can contest elections either. So you must see the relevant section 8, subsection 3 of the Representation of the People Act 1951. Similarly, in the same Act, section 33, subsection 7, no person can contest from more than two constituencies in Lok Sabha and Vidhan Sabha elections. Of course, 
after the elections he or she will vacate one constituency and this has happened many times but then a maximum of two constituencies are allowed in both Lok Sabha and Vidhan Sabha and once a constituency falls vacant and this brings to mind a special election once a constituency falls vacant because of the elected member vacating it willingly or the elected member unfortunately passing away or the elected member having resigned for some reason or having lost the membership for some reason and that provision is also there in the constitution then a special election is held to fill up the vacancy that is created and that election is known as a by-election. So we have seen universal adult suffrage and we have seen free and fair elections. So in the next episode we will talk about the election commission the body responsible for conducting elections in India in great detail. Thank you so very much. Thank you.